showing up. We have a special guest, John Kennedy. Uh, he's mentored tons of pros, great assistants to become great head professionals. Uh, he recently retired, so it's our honor to have him. John Kennedy, welcome. Thanks, Frank. Thank you. you know, I met Frank uh, last fall during the Squire Cup. The Squire Cup is a 27 hole event. I guess 18 just felt like 27. <laughs> and you play the, uh, you switch after nine, so I got paired with Frank. We went off on the 10th hole at Fenway, for those of you who played at Fenway. You know, the 10th hole is maybe 475. And uh, I've got a thing, as you get older, sometimes you'll hear about it, but you get a thing called spinal stenosis, which basically is a narrowing your spinal column. Some people get it, some don't. And I, unfortunately, I have it in my neck and my low back, so my rotation is very difficult. It's almost very hard to turn more than maybe 20, 30 degrees. And uh, so the gap between Frankie's backswing and club head speed and mine was probably as severe as anybody on that golf course. He <laughs> <laughs> steps up there and pops at about 320 on the first hole. I go, <laughs> but, I, but I enjoyed the afternoon. And uh, the way you carried yourself, uh, both as a golfer and as a gentleman, as a professional, it impacted me. And I've been around, because I've been around golf for 46 years as a golf professional and really around golf since I was 12 years old. So I'm 66 now, so that's 54 years around golf. So you've seen a lot of golfers and you made an impression. So Thanks. Did a good Appreciate job. Appreciate that. Did a good job. So first, <coughs> I want to thank the association for inviting me. Um, and I want to thank you gentlemen for coming, although right now it's probably better to be inside than outside in golf ball. Yeah. Play. <laughs> so we'll keep you here as long as possible. Thank you. Five minutes before you tee off. There you go. Um, what I'd like to do is, um, as Frankie said, I've spent a lot of time, I've been fortunate, um, you know, I was a golf professional at Westchester, so at Westchester you're exposed to a lot of things. You're exposed to a lot of staff. Um, my staff is 45 people, um, 27 golf professionals are people who are in the golf business. Um, so you do that for 26 years, you impact a lot of people. And probably because I've always been involved with the Met PGA, um, I've been involved with a lot of golf professionals throughout the section. And really my strength was always helping people with their business planning. Um, how do you buy? How do you budget? How do you hire staff? How do you train them? How do you negotiate a contract? And it's something that I still do. I um, got a call a few weeks ago from a golf professional in Vermont that I never even met. Um, but he had heard through another friend that he was struggling with this contract and he wanted to run some ideas by me. So to be able to be with you and share some of my ideas and things that I've learned over the last 45 years is something that I feel very strongly about. And I think that's one of the great parts of the golf business is that we um, care about each other. I think a lot of other businesses, um, not necessarily are cutthroat, but are not as uh, cooperative. And so I just encourage all of you, whether it's be with each other as you're playing golf today, or with uh, young guys working in the bag room, um, young interns that might come on staff, um, or it could even be a 15-year-old you know, that's picking balls on the range. I just encourage you to take that opportunity to share whatever knowledge you have, because it's it's an opportunity we have in this business, and I think it's a very special opportunity. I look back to the first assistance tournament. It was in 1973. We played at Middle Bay, which is on the, it doesn't even exist right now. I think it's under a different name on the South Shore of Long Island. And um, so we didn't have a format. I mean, a format was individual stroke play. And we went out and played, and one of the gentlemen who I worked with, who most of you would never know, a guy named Austin Stroud, um, shot 67. And there were 72 of us. And the next best score, and there were some good players. Um, you have good players in your group. We had some very, very good players in those days, in the uh, early 70s. And the next best score was 74. So you beat the field by seven strokes. So we met up afterwards, because we didn't have a tournament director. Charlie had just been hired as the executive director, and said, how are we going to divide up the purse? So he raised his hand. He said, I have an idea. I said, what's the idea? He said, winner take all. <laughs> 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 and. Um, so I got involved in the Assistance Association, and it was great, great fun to, uh, to go through that. And I remember in 1970, well, it would have been 1980, but I, I got my PGA card in 1976, um, played in the PGA Championship at Glen Oaks, uh, just opened that year, and um, it was great to play in that tournament. And then I applied for head professional's jobs in 77, 78, um, Jimmy McLean. Nick Minolis, Kevin Morris, who actually was a golf professional here, were some of my contemporaries. And um, so in 1979, I was president of the Assistant Association. We're playing the uh, championship at uh, Scarsdale. And so everybody's always talking about what jobs are open. It was the fall, and everybody's excited about who's in the running. 
and they asked me had I applied for the job at Cold Spring, which that one out. And I said, uh, I don't believe I did. So working at Sleepy Hollow, I kind of wanted to stay in Westchester. I was single. I didn't have a lot of financial pressure. I was making 12000 a year. I felt like a millionaire. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so, uh, but what happened was my father used to send my resumes in because he had an office and I didn't have an office. And so he'd get the bulletin from the med section, so he sent it at the Cold Spring. And uh, some people had recommended that they consider me for at least an interview. And so I went to the interview and uh, got the job. So sometimes things happen that you, you plan for, but you don't expect. So it was, uh, that's, that's how I started in the golf business. And um, I think what we'll start, you know, I asked Frankie to get some questions that are golf business related and then based on time and, and questions and so forth. Then I'll go into a little bit of my philosophy of life, which I think may be helpful to some of you. Um, I've actually written two books. And that's an amazing thing because I don't even use a computer. I have a laptop, but I rarely use it. Um, and I had a, uh, a member at Westchester who was a retired sports writer. And I guess it was probably about eight years ago. And he said to me, some of your ideas on instruction and improvement are a little bit different than things I've known. He said, so why don't you put them on paper? And so I would actually talk him to a dictator. He would take it home, transcribe it, send it to me. I'd mark it up, and we'd go back and forth and edit it. So they weren't famous books, for sure. I mean, books that basically all the money that I took, I gave to my foundation for the military. But uh, it was an opportunity to put my thoughts on paper. And so the first one was called Tales from the Lesson Tea. And it's kind of my view from teaching for 40 years, why I didn't think people improved as much as the time and the effort that they put into it. And then in my studies to learn about uh, how people improved, I read a lot of psychology books. And then I wrote a second book called You Can Do It. And those are lessons about how to improve at anything in life. Because it's all transferable information, as you know. Whether you're talking about hitting a golf ball, you're talking about uh, fitness, or if you're talking about uh, personal finance, or organization, or time management, it's all personal skills that are transferable, doesn't matter what the venue is. So I wrote that second book, and we probably sold about 500 of each through the golf shop, which was great. Some people bought it for their business, handed it out to their employees, and it raised some pretty good money for our foundation. And we started our foundation in uh, 2008, because we had the bar plays at Westchester in 2007. The first FedEx Cup event was held at our club. and. Um, I don't know if you remember, but that, that event was held in August, because that's when the FedEx Club started. And Tiger Woods withdrew on Friday. So I had bought, you can imagine how much merchandise I bought, anticipating a big crowd. I mean, we normally would get 15 to 20,000 people. We were anticipating 30 to 40,000 people a day. And so I had gobs of things. And the PGA came into my office on Friday and said, so we just got a, uh, an email from Tiger, he's withdrawn. So well, that's going to be that's going to be great. So the next spring, I was teaching one of our members, and he said to me, uh, "Do you have any merchandise left from the FedEx?" And I said, "I have about a hundred thousand dollars worth left over." And he said, "Because I have a nephew who's a captain in Baghdad, and he said a lot of soldiers in 07, really 04 to 09 was the real bad time in the Middle East. Um, a lot of guys were getting injured and losing limbs." And they would fly back through Germany. Well, the guys would get to Germ to the hospital before the clothes would get there. And so he said, I want to buy everything you have. He said, we're going to send it to the hospitals. So we'll send some to Baghdad, to the green zone. He said, and they'll share it. And I said, well, you can't do that because I already paid for it. But we'll be partners. And we started a foundation. So we raised money from that point forward every year. And then we would send pro shop clothing to army bases around the country. I and mean, it's been a great, great opportunity. Some of people have come to know. And that's... You know, I talk about the golf business as being great that we can share information. I think the golf business is also great for the people we can touch. So, um, so back, back to um, what we'll do is, again, I'll answer some of the questions that Frankie had gotten through, Teddy Hines, that maybe some of you had asked. And then, as I'm going through it, if you know of something that you've thought about that's sort of in that topic, just raise your hand. It's very informal. Or if you've had a success story at your club in your career, that you want to share with us, I think that would be a great opportunity to do it because there's no operation that you can go to, whether it's Westchester Hills or Westchester Country Club or Rolling Hills or Cold Spring, that you're not going to be able to learn something. Um, Bob Ford is a close friend of mine, and he and I are contemporaries. Actually, we both, although he's still at Seminole, both retired together last year. He was at Oakland, obviously, I was at Westchester. And Doug Steffen, who's a great friend, retired at Baltus Roll, too. So there are 
three pretty good jobs that opened up all at once. Um, but when we compared notes, we could learn from each other. And I felt like my operation at Westchester was pretty tight, and at Oakmont, even tighter. Um, and yet, when we compared notes, we always learned. So anything you can share as we go through this, I think would be helpful. Um, I talked a little bit about my background. So I grew up in Connecticut, in Fairfield, Connecticut. I grew up as a caddy, which is not normal these days. Uh, most guys grow up playing junior golf, play high school golf, college golf, and kind of become a golf professional. In my days, you grew up as a caddy, and that's how you learn how to play golf. Um, Julius Boros, has anybody heard of Julius Boros? So he actually was a, uh, an amateur golfer in Bridgeport, Connecticut um, in the 1940s at Fairchild Wheeler, which is a public course, 36 hole public course. Never won the club championship. He was basically about a three handicap player. He was an accountant in Bridgeport. Um, and then in 1952, he won the U.S. Open. And in 1963, <laughs> he won the U.S. Open. So it's an incredible story. So when he would play at Westchester, he would go back to play at Brooklawn just to get away from the tournament site, but just to kind of reminisce a little bit. Well, I was a kid. I was 13 years old. It was Tuesday of Classic Week, and uh, the caddy master called me. It was late on a Tuesday afternoon, probably 4 o'clock, and there was this Wilson staff bag that was about this big, and I was about this big. And he said, he said, John, take that bag, and I took it. It was like Caddyshack. And we get to the first hole, and it's the first hole of Brooklawn's is dog leg left par 4. And he gets it to the corner, which most of our members couldn't do, and he had about 160 yards left. And so he said, what do you think? And I, I'm thinking, five wood, I don't know, five iron. He said, no, give me an eight iron. <laughs> kind of bangs it up there, so I knew that that was a shot I hadn't seen before. So I grew up as a caddy, um, graduated from Fairfield University. I was an accounting major, and I was a senior in college. And you know, I was offered some accounting jobs. But I said, I'm not sure if I want to work in an office, um, so I think I'm going to try the golf business. And I had the dream. You know, I was a pretty good player. I was captain of my college team. And I thought that if I worked at a wealthy club, um, met some influential people, and got to play and practice at a high-end facility, um, my game would get better, and I could compete and play. Little did I know, when you work in the golf business, you play less golf than you did before you got into the golf business. And I remember being in the Westchester Open at Knollwood, and I had not played for about three weeks. And I remember standing on the first tee, looking at the fairway, doing a couple of waggles. And then I just kind of backed up and I said, I don't even have a swing ball. <laughs> <laughs> so I apologize. The guys had to kind of regroup and get ready to go. So, um, and then from there I worked, um, so my first job was at Rolling Hills as assistant starter. And then I worked down in uh, Florida. I worked in uh, Royal Point Siena, which is in Naples. And I worked at a place called Cypress Creek in Orlando. Mm -hmm. Um, those were my first kind of jobs. And then my first big break, I, I taught at Silver Spring in Ridgefield, Connecticut. It's a small club, but it gave me a great opportunity to teach. And from there, I was at a Met PGA Spring, as you were talking about earlier, you never know who you meet. It was a, uh, a spring educational program. And I sat at a table with Tommy Murphy, who was a head pro at Sleepy Hollow, who to me was a legend in the golf business. And we just were talking a little bit as the speakers were talking. And then when we got done, he said, why don't you come have lunch with me up at uh, Sleepy Hollow? I said, a great opportunity to go see a club like that. So we went, and, as it, and now at Silver Spring, I was making $6,000 a year. So it was $6 for a half hour lesson. The golf pro kept half, so it was three per lesson, plus 100 per week. And sometimes I'd give 50 lessons. So actually, the golf pro was making more off of me than I was making. But it was, it was a great opportunity to teach, and I appreciate it. So I'm making 6000 so Tommy Murphy's sitting there, we're having lunch at Sleepy Hollow, he's scribbling on the menu, and he pushes the menus over and he said, what do you think? And he had 12000 with a circle around it. Now, I, I didn't think it was a job interview, I thought it was just, you know, it was a social meeting. And he said, I want you to be my first assistant, that's what I think you're going to make. And I said, whoa. So that took my career from pretty good to a whole different level. Um, so again, that was a great, great opportunity. And then from there, I got the uh, head professional's job at, at Cold Spring. And one thing I'll share with you, again, I'm an assistant golf professional. I very much wanted to become a head golf professional. But I was happy where I was at Sleepy Hollow. So the job at Cold Spring looked on paper to me to be worth about $30,000, which is a lot more than 12000 But most head professionals at that point, 1980, were probably making about 50000 so I said, um, for me to consider this job, I think we need to increase it probably ten to fifteen thousand dollars. Now I was competing against a guy named Mal Galetta, who's now long retired, and a guy named Marty Fleckman, who 
who actually played the tour for a while. Um, and he was actually leading the U.S. Open at Baltusrol in 1980, um, the year that we applied for the job. So, but just by me having the confidence with that committee that they knew that I knew what the numbers were, um, they respected that. And they offered me the position and we were able to get the increase and really run the business. Because I thought it was going to be difficult to run the business under the business model that they had set up. So it's, it's important to be humble and it's important to be respectful, but it's also important to be confident and to be aware of what you're talking about. And that's true whether you're teaching at Golf Lesson or, or negotiating a contract. Um, put a note here, try, you know, there's 15, 16 of you here, there's going to be 60 of you, 70 of you playing golf today, however many are playing. Um, there's how many assistants are in the association? Probably 300, give or take. There are 300 different individuals. Every different one, every one of you have a di has a different background. You have different strengths. Um, so try never to compare yourself to the guy next to you. Try to learn from the guy next to you, but don't compare yourself to the guy next to you. Um, what you want to compare yourself to is your best self. Whatever your best self is, whether it be in terms of your uh, teaching ability, your playing ability, your tournament operations, um, your people skills, uh, your organizational ability, all those different things, we're all a little bit stronger, a little bit weaker, but try to compare yourself to your <coughs> best self. And if you do that, um, you're going to have a good life. But if you're comparing yourself to somebody else, you're always going to kind of beat up on yourself, and that's not going to help you at all. So try to use your time to motivate yourself to be your best self and not to be better than the guy sitting next to you. Even though you want to beat him on the golf course, and that's good. Um, so these are some of the questions that I received, so I'll go through them. And then, again, depending on time, I'll share some of the uh, thoughts I have for what could be my third book, although now I don't have a pro shop to sell it in, so it's <laughs> come to your pro shop. So, okay, one, the first question was, what kind of capital do you need to begin a business? So what you need to do, first of all, is have a 12-month uh, cash flow analysis. So what's a 12-month cash flow analysis? It's not very complex. Basically, you get a, a, an accounting paper with 12 columns and put your income on the top. And so let's say you're going to get a salary. And let's say you're going to have less than income. Let's say you're going to have bag storage income and maybe have range income. Um, maybe you have tournament winnings, whatever it might be. Whatever your income, and by the way, you can do this today. You don't have to be a head golf professional. You do that with your own personal budget. You know where your income stream is. And you kind of project, okay, in June, I'm going to give $15,000 worth of golf lessons. July, I'm going to do 18000 And then your second uh, portion is going to be your expenses. So if you're running a business, um, your number one expense is going to be your accounts payable. So let's say that you're going to do $300,000 in gross sales and you're going to project when you're going to make those sales. Um, what you're going to do is figure out how much merchandise you're going to need to make those sales, what's your cost of goods sales, cost of goods sold, and just put those into your column. So if you're going to sell, we're just going to pick a number. Let's say you're going to sell $50,000 in the month of May. You're probably going to need probably $40,000 worth of merchandise to create $50,000 in sales because you're going to have some merchandise left on the shelf. That merchandise is going to come in in March or April great sales in May. So you can play around a little bit, but basically what you want to do is have that all laid out so you're going to see when your money's coming in, and then you have payroll and you have operational expenses, accounting, legal, or whatever it's going to be. And then just spread that out. And it's going to show you month by month what's your shortfall is going to be. And then you're going to see when you're going to catch up when you're going to have a, a cash surplus. So that will show you when you either need to borrow a little bit of money from the bank or possibly you might need a loan from the club as you're first starting out. But it's very, very important you're able to do a cash flow analysis. And I would encourage you to do that for yourself today, whether you're an assistant golfer or not. And one thing I'll share with you, and it's hard. When you're an assistant golf professional, obviously it's different. You're hopefully not making $6,000, but it's not 1973. Um, but it's still, even if you're making $40,000 or $50,000, you know, you're paying tax on that, you're paying for an apartment perhaps, you have a car payment, you might have a student loan. It's hard to save money as an assistant golf professional, but whatever you can do to save some money, whether it be 1000 a season, 5000 10000 15000 I heartily encourage you to do that because it's so easy to get caught up in the lifestyle of the golf business. And everybody drives a fancy car and everybody has fancy clothes and you go out to nice restaurants with members. And all of a sudden you get into that rhythm 
and you're making fifty thousand dollars and you're spending fifty four thousand dollars and you have four thousand dollars in credit card debt what do you have when you're 35 or 40 years old you don't have a lot of money in the bank so i know it's difficult but i encourage you to save what you can and if you're able to have some savings make sure you have somebody who knows what they're doing to help you with advising you how to invest your money um, a little bit of money that you can start saving in your 20s and 30s when you get to be in your 40s and 50s is going to be very impactful. So cash flow analysis can be very important. Um, when, you deal, when you open up a shop, remember that you can ask your vendors for an additional 30 days. So if their normal terms are net 30 days and you're dealing with Peter Moir or Fairway and Green, you can ask the rep, can I get another 30 days? I'm just starting out. Um, and more often than not, they're going to say yes if you ask the question, so don't be shy. You know, your hard goods uh, manufacturers, usually it's 90 days, you can ask for 120 days. They're not going to give you a bigger discount, but they usually give you an extended dating. And just know that when you get into business, if you have a cash shortfall, um, don't be shy to call the, uh, the credit company and say, I'm a little bit short. Um, you know, I'm going to pay you, I owe you $15,000, I'm going to pay $10,000, and I'll make up the other $5,000. Just by communicating with them, very important. A lot of guys put their head in the sand. They go, oh, this is going to be a problem. I owe everybody money. I always talk to people. That's going to help you resolve any issues you have. Um, I would also recommend when you become a head professional to get a line of credit, even if you're not going to use it. Go to the bank. Uh, if you have a cash flow analysis, sit down with them. If you have good credit history, so try to develop good head credit history as you're going through right now in terms of car payments, college loans. And then you can go to a bank and get a credit line. It's good to have a credit line in case you need it. You don't want to go when you need it. It's good to have it ahead of time. So credit lines from a bank, very recommended. Second question that I received was, what are some of the management tools and systems that I use to hire and train staff? So I'm going to say first thing you want to do is to develop a, a written job description. Um, and you want to be pretty clear about what the expectations are. A lot of, not a lot of times, but there have been times where I've talked to guys who go and work for other people and they're very frustrated because their expectations were here and the reality was here. Um, and so they never really took the time to establish that job description up front. So make sure you have written job descriptions. If you're responsible for other staff at your club right now as an assistant, if you have people who are underneath you, um, Make sure you get something written down for them. Um, take the time to do that. And if you have somebody who's in the going their second year, what I recommend is that they write their own job description. They've been there for a year. They're coming back the second year. Have them write out what the job description is, and then you sit down with them and come to an agreement. Because you don't want it, you're never going to be on the same page every day. There's no way. A husband or wife doesn't do it. Best friends don't do it. A boss and an employee don't do it. But you want to at least start out with the best information you can have. So I encourage you to get those job descriptions written out and come to an agreement on those. And then for second year people, I, I would recommend that they write their own job descriptions and then you come to an agreement that that's, in fact, what they're expected to do. Um, opening evaluation, um, to me, very, very important. So I, I, when I do an opening evaluation, I do it with all staff. Um, my senior staff, I spend more time, maybe an hour. Um, junior staff you know, maybe a half hour, even part-time people. I want to sit down with them and, and talk through it. I ask three things, and I, I make them write it out before they come to the meeting. So number one, I ask, what do you expect to get out of this year? What are some of your goals? Number two, operationally, what do you think we can do as a team? So I get some feedback from them. And if I could, I have a guy who's working on carts for 20 years. He's got two or three really good ideas about bag movement. Um, but if I don't ask the question, you may never say it. So what can we do as a team? And number three, I always ask, what can I do for you? What can I do in terms of, uh, whether it be time off, whether it be uh, financial support through staff relationships, whether it be uh, sponsorships for the members, whether it's time that you can go away and, and look at another golf professional and see how they operate. So I want to hear those three things when the season starts. And then what we do is I do monthly evaluations. So sometimes it's formal, sometimes informal, depending on what's going on. But I like to sit down, if Frankie was working with me, once a month we're going to sit down at least for 30 minutes and say, how are things going? And then I want to give him feedback how I think things are going for him. He came in late, uh, late for work two times. That's important that he know that that's not appropriate. 
or, you know, a big thing with me was if you're working an eight to four shift, at five minutes to four, because everybody at four o'clock, they want to be on the tee at 4.05. They've been in that pro shop, they're getting hammered with phone calls. I said, five or four, you ask the people who are on shift with you, what can I do for you before I leave? And it could be the simplest thing. It could be taking the boxes from the back and putting them in the storeroom. It could be, uh, could you watch the counter for me while I go to the bathroom? Something like that, but it creates so much more of a camaraderie just by asking that question. So uh, monthly evaluations to me are very important. One of the great training tools that I used um, is a daily schedule. And I started doing it probably about 15 years ago. And it's a very simple thing. Basically, you have the staff members across the top of the sheet and the hours of the day down the left-hand side. So, Frank, I'm going to keep picking on you, or it could be Frank here. It's two Franks. Um, so if I have Frank, Frank on the first column, and you have seven till seven, if I put a line from seven till 10, that means he's at the counter from seven to 10. And then maybe from 10 to 12, I'm going to put the letter M, which stands for miscellaneous, and I'll tell you what that is in a minute. And then at 12 o'clock, he has lunch, and then 12.30 to 2, he might be at the counter again, so a straight line. And then 2 to 4, he might be P, which would be pricing. I can then look and see that I always have two or three people at the counter. Shotguns could be four. That everybody knows when they have lunch. Miscellaneous is when you have time to do your off-counter responsibilities. So say you're involved in tournament ops. Or say you're involved in a ladies' clinic. Not so much going out to teach, but kind of prepping for it, or you're getting ready for junior golf. You might have uh, five different responsibilities that are off-counter responsibilities. Well, that miscellaneous time is critical, because if you don't have that time, when are you going to get it done? You're going to get it done at 9 o'clock at night, and that's not very fair. So I found by being very clear about when people would be at the counter, um, it created a, a much better sense of, of fairness, but also the work got done. Because I didn't want to have, and at Westchester we had a lot of merchandise, I didn't want to have 75 boxes of merchandise sitting in the back when they need to be out on the floor. So I would go in the back the night before, and if I had a lot, I'd have a lot of pricing time the next day. And if somebody had a member guest coming up and they came to say, John, I need four hours tomorrow to make sure I get the tournament prep stuff. So they communicated with me. So that daily schedule is a great, great management uh, tool, and, it, and it's a very simple little one. Um, and then we would get together at the beginning of the season as a staff, um, all the full-time people. So we'd have, you know, 30 of us in a row, and we'd sit for about four hours. And we'd have a meal, and each person would get up and talk about what their responsibilities are. So this, um, these are the off-counter responsibilities. So you can see these are the full-time professional staff. And they have anywhere from four to seven responsibilities delineated. And um, they would talk about what their responsibilities were. And they wouldn't talk you know, in total depth if you couldn't remember what they were saying. But at least they would see, put a face with a name and say, OK, fine. You're in charge of hard goods. I know you're the go-to person in terms of ordering hard goods. And if you'll notice on this sheet, you see the dotted lines? That was Bruce Zabriskie's idea. And Bruce worked for me for a number of years. And he said, you know, John, if you put a hard line, that means they're responsible for it and nobody else helps out. Simple little thing, but he said, everybody's responsible for everything to a certain extent in the golf business. People are primarily responsible, but everybody can help out. So if a member comes and asks about their driver and would say, uh, well, Brian's out, um, he'll call you tomorrow. If you were the customer, that's not an answer. The answer is, let me go to the hard goods book, open it up, you place the order last week, it should be in in two days. So using that uh, chart and using the uh, responsibility, um, the daily responsibility, the daily schedule was very, very helpful in terms of training and managing staff. Um, paperwork challenge. When you get to be a golf professional, and even as, as certainly as, as a teaching assistant or as a first assistant, a lot of paperwork responsibilities. So you go into somebody's desk, and it's usually, you know, gets to be July and the pile is like this. So how did I management, uh, how did I manage my paper? I can't remember the exact year, but I think it was probably early 90s. Brendan Walsh, who's the pro at the Country Club in Brookline now, was at Patterson, where, where Frankie's working. 
and Brendan was the guy who I worked with a little bit and tried to help him with his career. As a matter of fact, I remember sitting in my office and I said, Brendan, what do you want? What's, what's your ultimate goal? He said, I want your job. <laughs> and as, as it would have it, about two, three years later, Don Callahan was going to retire at the country club. And uh, Brendan went up to interview for the head professional's job. And the, and the goal is to work with Don for two years. And if you did a good job, you get the job as director of golf. And so Brendan had a great job at the, at the Patterson Club. And we talked about it. He said, do you think I should go up there and you know, it's, it's not even necessarily a parallel shift because in Patterson I own a shop and make a little bit of money. And he had, I think, one or two children at the time. The children are young and I like Fairfield. My wife likes the area. And I said, Brendan, you're so good that I cannot conceive of you not getting that job if you're on site for a couple of years. So Brendan and I went to a, uh, a time management workshop in New York City and the guy talked about a paperwork management system which was so simple and you know, I used my whole career. So what you do, you have 12 panda fluxes that you hang in the hot hanging folder in your drawer for January through December. Pretty simple. You have 31 file folders, numbered 1 to 31, that represent the days of the week, the days of the month. Okay. So we're now about to head it to June. So what I would do is I take those 31 folders and I put them into June. And then I had a three wing binder and it's tapped 1 to 31. And that's my daily uh, go to sheet. So let's say tomorrow is May, let's, let's assume tomorrow is June 1st, just for the sake of this. So June 1st, what I would do is I'd flip open that three ring binder, and on the left hand side I'd have all the phone calls I had to make that day, and the right hand side I'd have all the tasks I had to do that day. And where did I get that information? I got it from the file folder, because I had been filling it with information. And let's say it's in June and I have a tournament to take care of, I have something to deal with with the ladies WMGA in September. That's a note that I have. I don't put that on my desk. That goes in the September Pendaflex. And sometime in late August, I'm pulling that September Pendaflex out, and I'm taking all that information, and I'm spreading it into those daily file folders. And then I also had a file folder for each key personnel, and I had about 10 of them. And so if I had my shop manager, I had my head professional, I had one of my senior teachers, uh, my director of instruction, each of them had their own file folder. <coughs> And if I needed, I had something I had to deal with them, it would go right into that sheet. So when I sat down with them, I'd pull that file folder, and it's all right there in front of me. Because the amount of paper that went through my office was staggering. And the amount of time that I would spend organizing papers, um, I didn't have time to do that. So I had a system that I learned that was very, very helpful. So it was the 12 pen flexes, there's the 31 file folders, and it was the three ring binder. And those, and then it was the individual uh, file folders for the, for the staff. So hopefully that'll help you a little bit with paperwork because you don't want to spend all your day on paperwork. Um, you don't, but you need to spend some time. And if it means that you're busy in season, you have to sit there at eight o'clock at night and spend a half hour to kind of organize your things, I highly encourage you to do it. You, you know, when you go to work and you feel good in your heart that you're ready for the day, um, you're just firing on all cylinders. But if you feel like you're all backed up, you're out late the night before, um, and then somebody comes in and asks a question, you're not ready for that question, it's not a good way to approach the day. So take the time to be organized. You know, we're, they say we're in a little bit of a sprint pretty much from Memorial Day to Labor Day. And so you really need to be ready for that next day. Um, and then one thing I, w I always did around lunchtime, because every single day got blown up for me. Every day. I had that, that nice little plan. I was all set. I had 15 phone calls to make and I had 10 tasks to make. And I was going to knock them off, and I got to work at 7 o'clock. And by 9 o'clock, I got one thing done. Because I had seven phone calls and six staff to talk to, and I had to go out on the golf course and check something with the superintendent. So at lunchtime, I would sit by myself, and I would take that sheet of paper, and I'd rip it off. And I'd say, OK, now it's 1 o'clock, and I've got three golf lessons, and I have, to I have to score a tournament, and I have to give out the awards. What can I get done? How much time do I really have? to manage things. I have about two hours. What can I get done in two hours? These I can do four things. These are the four things I can do. And what do I take? The other 15 I didn't get done, I put them on the next day. So, Or if I know the next day is busy, I put them two days later. So just by having that three ring binder, it's not like all these post all over the place. OK, fine. It's Wednesday. It didn't get done. It's going to go to Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Or maybe it's going to go to next week. <coughs> so that's that was very helpful to me. So just know that I reshuffled every single day. No day went according to plan. 
Um, next question that uh, I was asked is traits you seek when hiring. I'd say that number one trait is, and it's just like all your relationships that you have, is, is somebody's personal energy. When I sat with somebody in an interview, I could feel that they were really happy to be with me, to be at the club, and to be in the golf business. Um, some people project that, and some people don't. So just know that your personal energy is something that people feel when they go into an interview. I do a lot of uh, counseling for how to prepare for an interview. And I said, it's all about chemistry. When they sit, they have a feeling about, is that the guy I want to spend the next 5, 10, 15, 20 years with? Is that the person I want to kind of run my junior program? Um, so that personal energy is something that's very, very important. So remember to always try to project that. Number two is committed to service. Um, you know, we are golfers, and so golfers tend to be fairly selfish because we have to be in a sense, we have to spend time in our own game, and so we're very much to ourselves. And yet, the golf business is not about our games. It's about the respect they have for our games, but when somebody comes in the door to the pro shop, what do they care about? Themselves. Just like when you're a customer, when you go to a restaurant or you go to a store, um, you want to be serviced, you want somebody to, to make eye contact with you, to acknowledge you. They say that somebody's greatest need is to be acknowledged. Um, when you go into a, uh, into a store and somebody makes eye contact with you, even if they're busy and they're on the phone, you feel like you've been accepted. If somebody's shoulder is kind of turned to you, not a good feeling. So if somebody is committed to service, um, to me that's, that's a critical part of being a golf professional. Um, when I was I can't remember how old, it was a gentleman named Joe Moresco. He was the pro at Woodmere, um, and he was a great, great player. Um, and he was giving a talk, and he took, there's not a napkin here, but he took a napkin off the table where we were gonna have lunch. And he put a napkin, he put it over, he says, this is what the golf business is about. And I thought that was insulting. I thought it was like, you know, I'm not here to serve, I'm here to be a golf professional. He said, if you serve the people, you're gonna have plenty of time to do what you wanna do. If they feel as though you're there for them, they're going to bend over backwards for you. But if they think you're there for you, um, they're not going to be there for you. And I think that probably if, if I look back at my career and you went back to, I mean, people wouldn't remember me from 45 years ago, I'm sure, but certainly at Westchester and probably at Cold Spring, and you say, what do you remember about John? Is that he was engaged in caring about me and my family. And that might be the overriding thing about all else. You know, pretty organized guy, um, pretty good golf professional, ran a good operation, but I think it was more about that personal relationship. So that service is something I always look for. Desire to always grow, I think that that's, that's the essence of being a golf professional. And it's easy to get stuck in, okay, I kind of know enough about teaching, um, I kind of know enough about tournament operations, I think I know enough about giving speeches. But if you always try to grow and always try to learn, First of all, you, it's, it's exciting. Um, there was a guy named Ted Jackson. Um, I talked briefly, and somebody asked me a question last night about Jim McLean, because he and I kind of grew up in the golf business together. And Jim was at Quaker Ridge, and I was chairman of education for the men's section. He called me and he said, I've got a gentleman that I'm working with in my own game. His name is Ted Jackson. He's 92 years old. He's a retired psychologist. I think he might be a good speaker for the men's section. So I said, okay, that's fine. So I called Dr. Jackson and I said, would you come visit me at Cold Springs? So he sat with me and I said, Doc, I said, uh, talk to me about your background in golf. He said, I have no background in golf. He said, I barely play golf. He said, I was an industrial psychologist. He said, I, I became a family therapist when I retired just to help people with their lives. He said, and then a couple of golf professionals came to me because they needed help with their games. He said, and I realized that um, life and golf are so intertwined that if you're struggling in your life, it's gonna be hard to play and really be comfortable on the golf course. And he said, John, he said, I am so excited about this new part of my life. He said, I should be a sports psychologist. And so his energy at 92 showed me that you just never stop, never stop learning. And Bill Strasbaugh, of course, the Strasbaugh Award is named after him as a, a very good friend of mine. And, and the coach um, Never, he has a, had a phrase, but it basically has never ceased to learn. So I encourage, I always look for staff that always wanted to improve themselves and always learn because there's so much information out there that's, that's going to be available throughout your life. So it's going to make you stronger as a professional, but it's going to make the quality of your life that much better. Um, and then professional skills, 
I put it as the fourth thing. I mean, I think that it's sort of a given. You know, you have to be a reasonable player. Um, you have to understand the golf swing for sure and be able to communicate it. Um, you have to know management skills, how to get the best out of people. So I, I did look for professional skills, but some of those other things were the entry points to get you in the door with men. Uh, next question I was asked is current trends that excite you um, going into the golf business. So we went through a period of time where it looked pretty bleak. Um, and there still be, will, will be some clubs that will close, mainly in the southeast where they overbuilt some of the housing developments. But I think we're in a, in a, in a stabilizing and a growth period now. So I think you're in a, in a good spot um, that you want to take advantage of it. I'm, I'm pretty excited about that. I also think it's sort of a, just a, a parallel thing, but I think that the tour presence right now is very strong, both on the men's and the ladies tour. I, I was surprised the ladies tour actually survived, but I think it's gonna, gonna do fine. But I think that the, the personalities you have on those tours, particularly the men's tour, is gonna kind of stabilize some of the, the growth in the game over the next five, 10, 15 years. So I think that's a good thing, it's a benefit. I also think technology is something that's uh, exciting. Um, Certainly the whole uh, advance of launch monitors gives us credibility as teachers and club fitters that uh, can only elevate us. So I certainly encourage you to be as knowledgeable as that. And then you know, you're kidding around about how somebody uh, tries to reach out to you. And, and emails and texting can be painful because you do get it in the middle of the night and you do get it on your days off. But the ability to, to use that as a communication device is amazing. I mean, you know, because you know, we used to have to send out a monthly newsletter. Now if something's important, you have two spots left in a short game school, or you have a, uh, a special in the pro shop, you can get that information out in a very timely fashion. It's amazing how people respond to that. So, uh, so I think technology is a great great thing that's coming in. It's been in golf, but it's, it's only growing. And then all our growth of the game initiatives, I think are great. Um, obviously, PJ Junior League, um, you know, forward tees, you know, the partial round thing I tried at Westchester didn't really work. You know, six holes, three holes, I thought that time. But golf is such a traditional game, it's hard to really break some of that barrier. But I think anything you can do to encourage people to play, um, and just your personal energy and your, your enthusiasm for the game is going to make people want to do that. Um, favorite joke? Favorite golf joke? Not really. Uh, Mandel. Mandel. Oh, yeah. Okay. Good. Yeah. Good. That's good. That's good. All right. So I'll tell you a joke. It's not my favorite necessarily, but I just I'm not a big jokester. Um, but as golfers, um, we're always in trouble. And why are we always in trouble? Because we're always late. Right. We're always late because there's something going on. It, my my wife would always expect me home 60 minutes after I said I would be home because something would happen. And I was, so she just kind of programmed it in. Wasn't, she wasn't happy about it, but she programmed it. <clears throat> so this guy, and this guy's not a golfer, but he's just a golfer. So his wife said, you know, we're having the family over for Thanksgiving. She's been married for 30 years, and uh, they lived in the, in the South, so they could play golf on Thanksgiving Day. And she said, you know, you're always late. You're always late for everything. And this is an important day for me. So just know that if you're late for Thanksgiving dinner, it's over. 30 years of marriage is over. I'm sorry, but I just had enough. He said, honey, it's not going to be a problem. He said, uh, we live two miles from the golf course. I'm peeing off at 7 o'clock with my buddies. We're having dinner at 3 o'clock. I got this. It's not a problem. And there are a lot of versions of the story that you might have ever heard of. So off he goes, tees off, plays great. Shoots 78, he has a 14 handicap. It's like a career round, wins 50 bucks. So his buddy said, you won, so you got to buy lunch. He goes, it's 11.15. Great. Get down, have lunch. A couple of beers, this is great. Thanksgiving day, I'm gonna be home two and a half hours early. My wife won't know what to do with me. Takes a right out of the golf course, driving about a half mile down the road, and there's a car broken on the side of the car broken down the side of the road, he pulls over. It's a young girl there and he said, uh, what's the problem? She said, I'm a flat tire and I'm going to my parents for Thanksgiving. And That's not a problem. I got plenty of time, it's only twelve thirty. Takes out the jack, changes the tire, um, repairs it. She said, oh, I appreciate it so much. She said, I, I don't know how to say thank you to you. She said, uh, maybe I could offer you a drink. My apartment's like a half mile down the road. He said, uh, it's 1 o'clock. I still got two hours. Okay. <laughs> Goes to her apartment. She said, I'm kind of messy from trying to change the tire. Are you mind if I'm going to go change? He said, no problem. He said, I read a magazine. She comes out. Beautiful young girl. One thing leads to another. He gets home at 4.15. <laughs> 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 so... The door's locked. 
he's sitting in the garage, her family leaves, finally it's like 7 o'clock, he goes in, he said, uh, I don't know what to say, she said, well, I, I was clear, she said, today was the day and you're home, so it's over, you might as well pack your things, he said, you know what, he said, I've been married 30 years, you've been a great wife, he said, I'm going to tell you the truth, and so he went through the whole story, and he said, uh, and so, obviously, I, I did the wrong thing. She looked at him and she said, you expect me to believe that? I know you played another nine. <laughs> um, question asked about the skill set needed for technology. Um, obviously, technology is very important. So launch monitor for teaching and club fitting, that's a given. Um, maybe you're at a club that doesn't have a high-end launch monitor. If you are, then you need to go to a club that does have a good launch monitor and just ask if you can watch them work with that because that's a skill you really need to have. You don't have to be perfect at it right now, but you have to start. Um, email, um, just know that you need to respond within 24 hours. That's kind of the expectation. It doesn't have to be within five minutes. And then tournament programs, obviously that's a coming thing now using uh, whether it be Golf Genius or any of the any of the technology you need for tournament programs, but just to make yourself look more professional. Um, balancing life and work, um, you can't, you can't do it, so don't, don't try. There are times where, um, you know, I sort of said that memorial to Labor Day, um, where it's all in, and whoever is part of your life kind of needs to know that, um, and it's a challenge. It's a challenge to have a relationship. It's certainly a challenge when you have children. Um, doesn't mean you should be at the club 14 hours a day. There was a young guy who worked for me that became a director of golf, and he was up there about six months, and he called me, and he had two children. And he said, I'm really struggling. He said, I'm at the club till 9 o'clock. And I said, uh, you can't do that. You can't do that every night. I said, because there's always going to be work to do. I said, at some point, you have to realize you have to put it aside. And if that means you're going to be home before your children go to bed, um, you need to do that. So. The one thing I would encourage you to do is just think about, you know, there's a lot of books you can read about it. Uh, life is divided into four quadrants, and you have things that are important and urgent. So if you need to get your uh, license done today, and, and otherwise you're going to lose your license, obviously you got to get that done. Or if you got to run a tournament today, you got to be at the shop at 7 o'clock. Those are things you have to do. That's important and urgent. And then right next to it is important and non-urgent. And those are things that are your family. Uh, it could be your health, it could be your faith, it could be your professional growth, whatever it might be. We're gonna put in that box there. And then you have um, urgent and unimportant. And that could be things that you could um, certainly delegate to somebody else. It could be a phone call. Um, it could be uh, a task that you can certainly give to somebody else. So that's something that has to be done, but you don't have to do it. And then you're gonna have uh, non-important, non-urgent, and that's uh, watching the Cleveland Cavaliers. Mm. Even though it's fun to watch, but it's certainly we go into the box of non-important, non-urgent, unless you happen to be an executive with the Cleveland Cavaliers. So, so that upper right box, the important but non-urgent, is the one that always gets pushed to the side because it's non-urgent. So it's important to you. So I would ask you to identify what's important to you, and it's it. it could be your family, it could be your relationship. Could be professional growth, could be health, could be your faith. And make sure, absolutely make sure that you spend some time each day, and it might only be five minutes, might be more, involved in that. Because if you lose that, then you lose your compass. And, and it's very easy for life to push you around. And not only that, but if you spend time doing what's really important to you, it's going to give you energy and enthusiasm for things that maybe you're not as enthused about that you have to do. So maybe, you know, maybe uh, your golf game is very important to you. And if that means you have to get to work a half hour early or stay a half hour late, even though you're tired and you need to do it, make sure you do it. Um, so I just encourage you to make sure you do not forget what's really important and not urgent, because that's easy to get put off on the side. Um, and it's a great phrase, a successful person is not the person who does the most but it's the person who does the most important. So a lot of times you say, man, I'm working like a maniac. And people feel like you're not getting things done because you're not doing the most important things. And some of that goes back to the time management program I talked about where you kind of go through in the middle of the day and you say, okay, I've only got 
two hours to get something done, what's most important for today, and what can I push off to tomorrow? So identifying what's most important is, is a very, very important skill. And not everybody has it. And that's why some people succeed and some don't. Next question I got was, how do you impact club culture and policies to achieve operational goals? So you come into a club and it has its own culture, has its own personality. You're an employee and it's not for you to tell the members, we're gonna work really hard on pace of play or we're gonna work on a junior program if that's not where their heart is. But I would say this, that if you're the right person for that club, and I'm gonna assume that you're all the right person for the club you're working at, um, you were hired for a reason. And so what I would recommend is once you've established your staff and you hire the right staff and you train them and you inspire them and you motivate them and you develop policies in coordination with the golf committee and the board um, and if you're consistent, very important you be consistent so people know what to expect on Tuesday or Sunday whether it's 7 in the morning or 7 at night that you're pretty much the same person as best you humanly can be. I mean if it's 95 degrees it's hard and you've been teaching for 8 hours at 7 o'clock at night to have the same enthusiasm. But if you're consistent with your attitude and your behavior and your policies, what I found is that the club actually will get on board and will actually follow you as a leader because they, they don't do this for a living. They want a leader, but they only going to follow your lead if you're, if you're a person of integrity and consistency. So I went to Cold Spring, and Cold Spring was a North Shore, um, pretty crazy club. And I went in there and said, John, you're way too quiet and they're going to roll all over you. And I said, it's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. I said, they're going to find out that I charge tax to everybody just because somebody pays cash doesn't mean they're not going to pay tax. That I, uh, whatever my operational procedures are, apply to everybody in the club. And so what, it, what happened is that they got behind me and at Westchester, what happened was that the year before, Bob Watson had been the professional for 15 years before I was there, and then they had a professional for one year. And there was a lot of turmoil at the club. And there was a lot of, there was almost like two parts of the club. And there were people in the grill room that were complaining about this and complaining about that. And I said, I'm not going to be perfect, but I will guarantee you that within six months, they'll know who John Kennedy is and the way he operates. And sure enough, there were still a handful of people that weren't happy, but they were so marginalized because they were the kind of people that are going to complain all the time. But the majority of the members really got behind what we were doing because they knew that I had a vision and I had a staff that was going to follow that vision. So hire good people, train them the best you can be, um, give them good feedback, um, have consistent policies and be consistent yourself. And I think you can pretty much get the club to follow your lead and to be on board with a lot of your initiatives, the things that you think are important. Um, develop a Goodwill bank account. This is true in life. It's not just, I talked earlier about the fact that if you're getting off at 4 o'clock, ask the fellow staff member, um, what can I do to help you? In every relationship you have, you have a bank account, whether it's with your wife, with your girlfriend, with your friend, with your boss, with your fellow employees. Some people, or withdrawing all the time. Can you do this for me? Can you do that? Can you cover for me? Can you do this? Can you make that phone call for me? You get worn out. And other people are making deposits all the time. What can I do for you? How can I help you? Um, I know you're sick. Why don't you, why don't you knock off? I'll cover for you. Let me see what I can do. Or you're, you're struggling at home. You have a personal problem. Let's sit down and talk about it. If you're constantly making deposits in that Goodwill bank account, you have something that, that's invaluable. And you're not doing it because you want to take advantage of it. You're doing it because you really care. So I would encourage you to constantly make deposits in your Goodwill bank account with every relationship you have. And it's going to be something that's going to be of great value to you. And then people will be there for you when you need them. Because it's, you know, life is, sometimes you're kind of sliding along and everything's going well and you're playing well and members love you and BMW looks great. Everything's fine. And I will promise you this because Everybody in the room is substantially younger than me. Nobody's life is what it looks like from the outside. Nobody. And nobody gets a free pass. Nobody goes from point A to the end and doesn't struggle. And everybody needs friends and everybody needs a support system. So if you're there for people, people will be there for you. And then I would encourage you to get reliable feedback in, in everything that you do. Um, 
you must have somebody that you respect and just ask them, how do you think I'm doing? Um, it could be personally, it could be professionally. And sometimes what they say might hurt, um, but better to hear it than to not hear it. So I encourage you. And as a matter of fact, if your boss um, doesn't do uh, evaluations of you, I would ask him, could you make some time to do that? You know, maybe he's not the most organized guy. Maybe his style is different than John Kennedy would do. But I would encourage you to get that feedback. But get feedback in everything you do. Um, so anything, like you're, you're in your careers now, so you may have things that you're coming up against, uh, whether it be applying for jobs, um, <coughs> while you're in the job, how you deal with other staff, how you deal with committees, how you deal with pace of play. So I'm, I'm going to just leave this open for a little bit, and then I can go into a couple other things. Anybody want to ask any questions that we can help you with? Give an idea of this. Um, this was Ben Hoffheim who replaced me, and Ben had worked for me when he first came to the golf business in the mid '90s, um, and did such a good job that he was a leading candidate. Well, we had some great, great candidates from around the country for my job because it's, it's a great job. Um, so this was Ben's professional portfolio, and he handed in for his interview. So just to give you an idea, and I think when I applied for the job at uh, Westchester in 1991, it was the first booklet that was done in the Met section. Um, people just didn't do it that way. And now it's, it's a standard in the industry. So, uh, yes? Uh, I was going to ask for guys who are sitting in this room who may be a little younger that get you know, positions, assistant positions, or teaching positions at you know, various clubs when they get hired, and have staff members that are older that have been there, let's say you know, staff members that are also assistants that are 45, 50 years old, yeah. and now you're 25, 30. Yeah. How do you go about trying to try? There's obviously an, an authority standpoint from older versus younger, being in the business longer versus shorter. Yeah. So how do you kind of, if you're trying to direct other staff to do things, how do you suggest doing that without coming off as being a boss? Yeah. 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 I think so. I think probably what you need to do is develop a little credibility early on to show that you're a uh, person that's trying to help out. I think if they see that you are a, a per now, I'm going to assume that that 45-year-old guy um, is a person of value, you know, because sometimes you're going to run somebody just as not a good guy. And that's, that's a problem. It doesn't matter if you're a good guy. He's just seeing you as a threat. So um, that gets back to the beginning of finding out what, what's the job description. Um, what is, uh, you know, what are the expectations? What is your boss expecting? What are your areas of responsibility so you're not stepping on somebody's toes? But if you're all kind of parallel in terms of responsibility, then, and assuming he's a, a reasonable guy, I think that first you have to develop a little credibility. And I think that uh, sitting down and talking to somebody, don't assume anything. Um, ask questions, because people, if you ask somebody a question, people are ha happy to answer. So if you sit down and say, what do you think about this? What do you think about that? So that you kind of get their buy-in. Those would be the two best. So assuming he's a pretty good guy, and assuming you all have clear responsibilities, I would do that. I would first develop some credibility through your performance, and then secondly, sit down and say, um, ask their opinion and get their guidance. Because if you get their buy-in, they're going to be a supporter over you, not a fighter over you. I don't know if that answers yeah, your no, question. Yeah, perfect. Yes. You said about showing your personality in the interview process. Mm -hmm. Did you have like a set routine you would follow, or would you let the people in the room dictate what you said and what you did? Yeah, great question. So there are two types of interviews, and usually they'll be formatted before you go in, and so it's important to know that. Is it going to be a Q&A from the committee, or you'll be allowed to make a presentation? When I went to Westchester, the format was you will talk for two hours, two hours. And then there'll be questions. So I had mentioned that Jimmy McLean, so Jimmy and I played in the Westchester Open in 1976 and became great friends. From that point forward, because Jimmy was such a great teacher player, um, I became his business mentor. So when he went to Sunningdale, I helped with his contract. When he went to Quaker Ridge, when he went to Sleepy Hollow. And in the circle of life, he was a consultant at Westchester when I was hired. So I drove home to Long Island, and he called me that night, and he said, how do you think the interview went? And I said, not well. And he said, why? And I said, because I didn't feel, I didn't get 
almost any questions when I got done. And I said, I didn't feel that energy with the, with the committee. And he said, John, you answered every question before they could ask. <laughs> he said, so the next time, if you could call back, just let him know who John Kennedy is. So, so my preference is to go in there with an agenda about what you'd like to talk about. You do your research on the club, talk, take a look at all the different areas, find out what they're looking for, what their strengths are, and try to focus on that. It could be teaching, it could be tournament operation, it could be staff management, and have a presentation prepared. And I prefer you be able to do that, because what happens in most interviews, they're like ad hoc questions, and you don't get to tell your story. And what you think is really important never comes out. So I'd like you to be able to, if, they, if they're open to it, say, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like, I have a presentation I'd like to make, um, and this is my vision for Westchester Hills Country Club. And if you'd allow me to do that, and then we could do questions as I go along, or we could do them at the end. So usually they'll have it set up in advance, but my preference would be that you go in with a presentation, because you get to tell your story. And then if, when you leave, that's all you can ask. If you got a chance to tell your story, but if you get sometimes, like if you go to a rule seminar, sometimes they get off on some tangent on one question, it's been like 40 minutes on a drop that you're never going to make. So, I would, you know, I would encourage you to do that. I don't know, does that answer your question? Okay. Um, I know it's 11, so what I'd like to do is I just kind of quickly, if I could, in sure. a couple minutes. Yeah. We want to stay inside. It's warm anyway. Um, <laughs> I'm not going to spend a lot of uh, time on this, even though I think it may be the most important thing I'm going to tell you right now. But this book that I may or may not write, it's called The Five Choices. And I think that everything we do, every day, we make these choices. And so I look at choices as something that either move us forward, closer to our goal, or hold us back. And so these are the choices I think we make every day. Number one is to plan. Um, some people plan and some people don't. And they, there's a phrase that says, failing to plan is planning to fail. So I encourage you, I used to tell my staff, I said, on Sunday, you got your schedule. And you can take a look at the weather forecast for the next seven days. And you know you're going to be working from 8 to 4. And then you're going to work from 12 to 8. But you know that that 12 to 8 day is the morning when you can hit some golf balls and work on your short game. And you know 8 to 4 is when you can go play nine holes. So don't, or you're going to do some lesson observations, but don't tell me you didn't know. I said, because you know. It's taking time to plan. So I would I definitely encourage you to be a planner. Um, it's a great phrase. It says, success is when opportunity meets preparation. So um, just know that, uh, and, I, and I would expect that, um, you know, as a golf professional, I always say you need to be exceptional at one or two things and confident in everything. So you can't be great at everything. But pick what you're going to be exceptional at and be competent at everything else. So you need to be good enough at management, good enough at tournament operations, good enough at rules of golf. I would say if you're in the Met section, you really need to be exceptional at teaching. Because I don't think that you're going to make it in the golf business. Um, and that's why I got the job at Westchester, by the way. Then people think it's because I was a businessman. It's not true. It was my energy for teaching the game that won them over. They knew I could manage. That was critical because you're going to have a big staff. But it was my energy for, for helping people play the game that really was the difference, they told me. Um, so number one, choice number one is, is planning, and I would become a planner. And under planning, I put down, ask yourself, and it's just like any goal setting, what do you want, why do you want it, and when do you want it? Make sure when you're, when you're doing your planning, you answer those three questions. you got to know what you want. you got to know why you want it, why it's important to you. And you have to put some kind of timeline on it so you can evaluate whether you're doing okay with your plan. Choice number two is honesty. Um, Got to be honest with yourself or you're not going to know, first of all, uh, where you're headed and also how you're doing as you're getting along. You can't kid yourself. If you're a bad putter, you got to recognize you're a bad putter. Um, I would say that um, to be successful in anything, you got to answer yes to these two questions. Can I do it, and is it worth it? So I told you earlier on that I have spinal stenosis. So I, actually, if we play today, actually, Frankie saw it, I actually have a two-piece swing. Because what I had to do is I had to get the club somewhat on plane. Because what happened is I would get here, and nothing would move. 
So then my arms would go up and I would get maybe 10 degrees of rotation. So just by hinging here, I've already got a little bit, probably 15 degrees of rotation, then I can move it just enough so I can probably, you know, hit the ball. So I went from hitting the ball 190 yards in the air, where now, because I, you know, I play a little bit down in South Carolina, we're going to build our home, I can hit the ball about 230 yards in the air. So I picked up 40 yards just by that, just by that movement. Um, but I can't hit the ball 270 yards in the air. It's not going to happen. So I have to be able to say, can I do this? So can I be a hit pro? Yes um, or not. You know, you have to say in your heart, can I do it? And then is it worth the effort? You know, if I'm trying to get in shape and I say it's going to take me an hour a day in the gym, maybe I'm not going to have the, the motivation to do that. So you got to be able to say yes to those two questions with honesty. And your heart has to be engaged. It's like when you have a student. You know, you can't make them want to practice. They have to want to practice. That's to be in their heart. And a guy used a great analogy that I read in a book. Um, and he talked about if you imagine an elephant and somebody sitting on the elephant, the rider, and the elephant is your heart and the rider is your brain. So we all know we shouldn't smoke. So your brain has been told, don't smoke. But your heart doesn't want to stop. So the elephant's going along and the, and the brain up top, the rider is kicking and screaming and say, go to the right. So I don't want to smoke, go to the right. Where is it going to go? The elephant's going to go where the elephant wants to go. Not, not based on the little guy on top. So whatever's in your heart, that's what you're going to do. So just know that honesty is very important. We talked earlier about getting trustworthy feedback. Make sure you do that. And always ask yourself, does this behavior serve my goal? Do I need eight hours of sleep? Uh, do I need to be more fit? Do I need to eat better? Do I need to spend time with more quality people? Whatever behavior you have, is it serving the goal you have? And I, I made a note here. It says, uh, I'm, glad I'm, I'm glad I did, not I wish I had. Try to, try to always be able to say that to yourself. Choice number three is discipline. Discipline is doing what doesn't come easy. If it, if it was, everybody would have it. But just know that you, know, you can't grind it out every day. You can't just be pounding against it. It's hard to do that. So how do you, how do you really get discipline? You develop new habits. Now, you've all heard that. They've done a lot of studies on habits. And to create a new habit, they used to talk about 21 days. It takes 60 days. 60 days to develop a new habit. But if you're committed to 60 days, you can actually change what you do. So I would encourage you, and you can encourage your students too. And the reason most people never change, because they never get to the 60 days. They never get there. And it's not easy, but if you're really serious about changing, you have to commit to a habit. And then by having new habits, you don't need to be disciplined because it's the way you do things. But if you're always butting up against your habits, it's going to be a, a never-ending uh, losing cycle. And this is, a, I think, is a, is a very helpful little technique. It's called naming the negative you. So just give yourself, so my name's John. My negative uh, me is Bob. And what that means is when I don't want to, I usually try to get up, you know, as you get older, you get up earlier. So I'm usually up at about 5 o'clock in the morning. So I'm, I'm usually reading in the morning. And about 6 o'clock, I like to do some exercise. And sometimes I'm not in the mood. So I'm sitting there just reading a book, and I just say, come on, Bob, let's go. <laughs> And it's just a little, and it's just a turn of a phrase, and you could use it at work, um, but it's just a, it's a nice little technique that kind of reminds you, okay, negative guy, let's, let's get going here. Um, behavior is choice number four, and we all know that um, it's all about instant gratification, uh, everything's got to be now, and we know when we're teaching people, the most difficult thing is to get them to understand that it's a process. So just know that you choose to honor behavior or you choose to honor outcome. If you choose behavior, you're going to go play today, and you've got a, a setup thought or a swing thought that you're currently using, and you're committed because you believe it's right. And maybe you're not, uh, it's, you're not getting it right on the button when you're doing it, because maybe you're making a change, but you say, I'm committed to this. You know long term that's going to be good. You know, stay with that process. Um, because if it's all about outcome, you're flipping back and forth all the time. That's just not good. Um, John Wooden, the great coach from uh, UCLA, he said that if you get a little bit better every day, just a little bit better every day over an extended period of time, you're going to be a lot better. So it's all about honor and behavior. And if you do that, if you choose behavior, um, long term you're going to be better. Great phrase, pain is inevitable, 
the spare is optional. I'll guarantee you, pain, you watch them play TPC, and those guys dunking it, that's painful. <laughs> but somehow they got up the next morning and were able to play, so they didn't have the spare. And then choice number five is gratitude. Um, we all talk about it, but it's not just about uh, being grateful, even though I, I believe we should be grateful. I mean, we're here playing golf, and, and uh, you know, a lot of people you look out here and don't have access to this kind of a facility and this kind of an opportunity where you go to work is an incredible place and you're working with people that are trying to be in a good frame of mind. So I encourage you to be grateful, but it's also going to help your performance because if you're grateful, it's not all about you. And you take some pressure off you. But if you're always self-focused and it's always about me, you put too much pressure on yourself and then when you don't perform, you start beating on yourself. And what does that do? It's a vicious cycle. But if you have gratitude for what you do and you accept you gave it your best. You go out there today and you shoot 85 and you say, you know what, I gave it my best. On each shot, I gave it my best. You get in your car, you drive home, you're okay. But if, if it's all about, oh, I supposed to shoot 72 and I shoot 85 and I'm a hack and I'm not a golf professional, what am I doing in this business? That's not gonna do any good tomorrow when you open that shop and that person comes in the door. So find something to be grateful for. Um, for me, um, I was fortunate, I was born in a family of eight, so it wasn't about me and being the oldest boy, you kind of took care of the younger ones. Um, but it was certainly when I got involved with the military um, that it gave me a cause that was way bigger than anything I can imagine. So whatever the cause could be for you, I just encourage you to be in that, to get involved in that cause. So um, hopefully what I said today will be helpful as you go through the season. Um, You've got a, a, you know, it's a great, great life for me. I still have it. You know, I'm still doing some consulting with golf professionals. But I encourage you to uh, remember to serve others. Um, be kind to yourself. Um, you know, inspire yourself. Um, spend time with good people. And, uh, and just enjoy this great season. But I appreciate the, the opportunity to spend time with you. John for taking his time out for being here today. Um, thank you, John. Um, once again, if you came in late, circle your name right here on the clipboard. Uh, it's 12 o'clock shotgun. Other than that, play well. Good luck. Thank you. My negative means going to be Matt. Yeah. Come on, Matt. Do your job. Come on, Matt. <laughs>